As I felt talking to Spiegel that he didn't feel the holdup was on the American side, although I, I, I realize that Shalom has, you know, certainly has had a lot of high-level negotiations. So you can see this as, as an honest difference between us. But I think there's, there has been an honest effort to try to demarcate these settlements in the past. And I, I do think that effort was undertaken by Israel and by Baruch Spiegel. And there was, he put years into this, and I think that's, that's important for people to know there was a good faith effort to really get to the bottom of this, so to speak. Can everyone uh, hear the ba- by can the doors? Can you hear David? Can you hear me? Yes. All right. I try to talk loudly. If, if I, look, I'm not going to give you a lot of uh, maps here. Um, look, this is kind of the situation today. Uh, some might call it the soup. Uh, it's, it would say, there's no way. You see this map, and you say, there's no way. The blue areas would be settlements. These are not rivers or anything like that. These are settlements, and they're all over the map. The, uh, the, the brown areas, the darker brown areas, tend to be the Palestinian population centers, the cities. You know, you have Janine in the north, you have Nablus, you have Ramallah, you have Jerusalem, you have Bethlehem, you have Hebron. So if you look at this map, you say, forget it, we're all wasting our time. This is so, in, in, you know, they're all, it's like spaghetti. They will never be able to extricate this, and we are doomed to confrontation. Um, that's one way to look at it. Uh, now, <laughs> I don't think so. You could say I'm, I'm, not, I'm an optimist by heart, and I think that there's a problem solving ways to address this. This would be the numbers are using uh, two point, uh, over 2 million Palestinians and uh, 297,000. Again, these do not include, I want to reiterate what I said at the outstart in case people are going to ask me. This does not include Jerusalem, which Israel does not call a settlement. There would be another probably 280,000. There's a map, if you want, uh, that we can look at, because I figure there might be questions about Jerusalem uh, there. And there's more, uh, another uh, couple hundred thousand Palestinians there. Some people could question some of the Palestinian statistics. And I'm, I want to preempt that discussion by saying I don't think it fundamentally changes the contours of this but we could discuss uh, and go down in the weeds further. Okay, so this is kind of the status quo. Uh, you know, I should say, just to reorient, you know, there's Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, you know, Haifa, you know, et cetera. Okay, here I would call this a 70% uh, percent option, which would say there's a, there's a way out that would enable Israel to keep 70% of the settlers. And um, the way to do that would be to say, as Shalom said, and you heard it right here, you know, basically, the, you know, there's the area, oops, sorry about that, uh, 70%. You basically have, um, you know, you have uh, Jerusalem right there. You have, Ar- you know, just use this thing. You have Jerusalem, and uh, you mentioned a place called Ariel that has around uh, 16,000 people right there. You have Malay Dumim. Some of you may have family or visited there, right to the east of Jerusalem. That's right over here. Uh, you might have heard a place called Gush Etzion. What's new, if someone wants to tell me, you know, come back from policy conference and say, give me a trend that I don't know, that I don't read in the papers on the settlements. What's fascinating here is the growth of the ultra-Orthodox settlements. And it used to be, when you said, give me the name of the biggest settlement, you would say Malaya Dumim. Now Malaya Dumim is in third place. What's in first place is an ultra-Orthodox place called Modi'in Elite, which is right here. Sometimes it's called Kiryat Sefer. And, another t- and there's another place called Beitar Elite. Some people think Beitar, they think more revisionistly could, but it's, it's an ultra-Orthodox area. And when I was saying that you know, the 77 push was, you know, build, you could build everywhere. But Sharon very much tried to cultivate two constituencies. The professional Israelis the, in the suburban areas uh, for the, to go to the settlement blocks. Because he thought that would, you know, these are not the people who are going to move to Nablus and places like that. And the ultra-Orthodox. He tried to enlist them in the effort, but he kind of made clear, you're right not adjacent to the green line. So, you know, no, you're not talking about living over there. And those two constituencies, more than anything else, really gave this thing a boost. So, 
my point here is, is there a way out that would say that these settlers, and, and you know, to be fair to them, they've been living in legal limbo for 40 years. Now there's many of them more than there were 40 years ago. But they've been living in a legal limbo. No Israeli prime minister has succeeded in annexing one of them. Not one. Not a Likud. Not, a, not Begin. Not Shamir. Not Sharon. Not Netanyahu. They remain in legal limbo. So the question is, is there a way out that would say, you're not called settlers anymore. You're called, you know, that you live as part of sovereign Israel, not in, 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 in territory whose legal status is disputed. No one's going to complain anymore when you build. And this is where 70% of them live, right in these areas. So it takes up much less space than um, people would think. Uh, as you see the numbers down here. And, uh, and yet, in, yeah, in terms of, of, uh, of actual percentages, we're talking about something that is, you know, that is, that is tiny uh, in terms of numbers. Now, you know, if you're a Palestinian, you'd say anything is too much. And, uh, and that's why the issue of land swaps have, have come up. Here are some area land that is irrigated here. And it would all net out if, if they wanted to do that land swap. And you've heard, you know, Prime Minister Olmert, whose map has not been disclosed of what he negotiated with the Palestinians, but he agreed to this idea that would be a one-for-one -one land swap, that whatever Israel would uh, accept, whatever Israel would take, it would give. So it's a one-for-one -one basis. And even the Palestinians who you talk to say to you, you know, they'll even quote you, even Arafat would say, of course. It, land swaps are fine. So they might argue over which land swaps, but something that nets out. And then you'll hear Palestinians say to you quietly, you know, Gush Etzion was Jewish once, before 1948. And that, that's not something they're saying publicly, but they know that Israel is going to keep Gush Etzion and keep Malay Adumim and, the, and this area right around here and right around here too. The big argument, I think, will be over the Ariel area, which is right here. Now, here's another one which says, what if you take the same idea and you take it farther? Instead of trying to get 70% of the settlers, try to get, you know, 80% of the settlers. And then you're talking about 240,000 people. That's, again, outside of Jerusalem, 240,000 who live in, uh, in, a, in less than 4.5% of the land. When you talk about the land, it's, it's West Bank and, and Gaza and, uh, and all the area put together. But um, that would get more area. And there's an area north of, uh, of Ariel called Kidumim, that's right up here. And then the settler leadership lives really largely, not exclusively, because they live all over, but they live in two places. One is called Beit El, you may have heard of it, and one is called Ofra. And if you extend it from 70 to 80 percent, you're still under 4.5% of the land, but now your number is up to 240,000 people. So is there a way out that could tell 80% of the settlers that they've been kind of upgraded, that their legal status is no longer in dispute? And uh, that would be, um, it could have some incentive for them because instead of being in the legal limbo where they've been like bargaining chips for the last 40 years, now, the question is obviously asked under these scenarios, what happens to the, to the 20%? Where do they go? That's 60,000 people. Now, many of them are children. I, we did some numbers on who voted in the last election, and of that remaining 60,000, and, and I'll uh, conclude on this point, uh, only 23,000 voted. Which, and we think the settlers are very politically astute, they're very active, they're mobilized, they're activists by nature, and we just think they have a lot of children. So of the 60,000, a lot of them are just kids. And whether they're 23,000 adults, you know, I, I cannot say. But the question is what happens to them, and I, I want to preempt the question and then I'll sit down. Because uh, someone is going to ask me, well, why don't they just stay and live in Palestine, and isn't that the best kind of litmus test of Palestinians' intentions that they should live in Palestine and they shouldn't leave at all. And I think it's a fair question. 
And that is for the negotiators. I'm not here to say what they're going to do. Um, you know, you can present both sides of it and say, well, they should just live there and live in their homes. The Palestinians will say, yeah, let them stay. But they took the land from their view illegally. And now we'll give them different land under the new Palestinian state. Uh, and there'll be uh, other settler leaders have told me, look, we've come to live in the state of Israel. OK. We, 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 got, we came to live in the state of Israel, and we're not living in the state of Palestine. So we wouldn't want to live there. And there's, we can get into that conversation later. But uh, anyway, these are just some of the points. I have a map with Ramat Shlomo and, uh, if you, in the Q&A, but why don't I stop here now? Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Uh, so we've given you uh, some parameters in terms of the origins of the settler movement, the different types of settlements, some informal understandings that were worked out between previous governments, and looking forward, some potential solutions. I'm going to turn it to you, Steve, to turn it over to our audience for questions. Okay, great. We're going to turn it over to the audience Hello now. From New York City. I think that due respect to the panel, I find you that you have already defeated our objective of peace by assuming that the settlements have been established as an obstacle to peace. They were established by the government as a basis to protect Israel, and as such, I would have appreciated if you would address both points of view. The second point is... You know what, can you... I think everybody here would like to hear questions and yeah, not comments. I'm coming to the question. Leave it to a question, yes. please. My question to you is, you never touched on the point of the Jordan Valley. Uh, if the settlements are withdrawn from the Jordan Valley, then the terrorists will bring armament just like in Gaza, and then the whole of Israel will be attacked. Thank you. She used to like me. You missed the question mark at the end of that. You missed the question mark. The question is, how are you going to handle the Western the Jordan Valley, from where all the terrorists will bring armaments, just like when we withdrew from Gaza, that the armaments came from the Sinai, and now no settlement or no town in Israel near Gaza can live in peace. The same thing will happen to Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Um. First, we didn't say that the settlements are an obstacle or not an obstacle. We said that the settlements will be solved in the context of solving the territorial issue between us and the Palestinians. If we want a two-state solution, we have no choice. We have to divide the country. And the settlements, as David portrayed in his map, are scattered all around. You cannot create a reality of two states if the situation will remain as it is. Now. Regarding the Jordan Valley, we are talking about any final status agreement that will be reached between us and the Palestinians. We'll talk about returning territory to the Palestinians in the 90s. This was in the parameters of Clinton. This was in the offer that Prime Minister Olmert gave uh, the Palestinians. What does it mean the, uh, uh, in the 90s? It means that 90 percent and up. 90% and up, and then a swap of land. 92% and a swap of 8% land. 93, 94, 96, doesn't matter. If you're talking about 90s and the up, it means that the Jordan Valley is not part of it. You can reach uh, security arrangements in the Jordan Valley, but you cannot stay in the Jordan Valley as part of Israel if you're talking about a solution that will talk about 90% and up from, uh, from the territories. Unlike in Gaza, we have, and I served in Jordan for five years, we have a government in Jordan that are supervising the border. Since the peace treaty between Israel and Jordan, there was not a single terrorist attack that, uh, that uh, took place from, uh, from Jordan. And I don't see, um, you have to take everything in, into consideration, but Jordan is not the case as it is in uh, Gaza or in, uh, in other places, and 
uh, at some point you have to take the risk. Now, if the settlements will be there or will be in the Jordan Valley, it doesn't mean that rockets cannot be poured on Tel Aviv or on Kfar Saba or on other cities in, in, uh, in uh, Israel. Well, I thought we had peace. You know what, sir? We're going to have to ask another question. Uh, we're going to alternate between the front and the back. Okay. Sir? What do you think of that session that you just came out of? I feel very dissatisfied from the session because for three reasons. One, it didn't present both sides of the point of view. Two, it assumes that being a settler is being guilty. And three, which is the most important, did not cover the issue why the settlements were established, with which they were for the security of Israel. And if they are removed, that will affect the security of Israel, just like Gaza did. What do you mean? Well, when, when we withdrew from Gaza, we were promised that our total withdrawal from Gaza will bring peace and security for the state of Israel. The withdrawal of Gaza proved, proved totally incorrect because not only it didn't bring peace, but it created a footfall for Al-Qaeda and strengthening of Hamas, which has resulted in absolute impossible living condition for the south of Israel and with the acquisition of additional and new rockets we are being threatening Beersheba, Ashdod, Ashkelon and who knows even Tel Aviv. And so what was it about that their proposal that, that you find untenable? My biggest problem with the proposal that they didn't evaluate the benefits of having Jewish citizens living in Judea and Samaria and they totally disregarded the Jordan Valley, which is the buffer zone preventing arms smuggling which to the terrorists. If the arms are smuggled to the terrorists, we are going to have the same thing which happened in Gaza. They will bring rockets into Judea and Samaria and therefore bomb Jerusalem, Luda Airport, Tel Aviv for sure, even with small 10-mile 10, 10 rockets, and if they get more sophisticated, there'll be no place in Israel where you can exist. And therefore, I think the protection of Israel is based on having a strong and secure Jordan Valley presence of Israeli citizens to protect Israel. So how is it then that the, that, that the panelist who was there from Israel was, was making these recommendations. Doesn't he have this to fear as well? I mean, more so than, than those uh, living in Galus. Well, he, the panelist who lives in Israel and was part of the negotiation, had vested interest in the negotiation. And when we came to the point of the security of Israel, he admitted, and his, his admission to my statement was, we have to have faith. Well, I'm sorry, with faith, we had faith in Gaza, we had faith in Lebanon, we had faith in giving uh, so many cities to the Arabs, and the results have been one thing, war, and war, and war. So how can we have faith when actually Einstein said, you are in, what is the definition of an idiot? A definition of an idiot is a person who does the same mistakes and expects different results. So my opinion is that anybody who put, puts Israel in such a dangerous situation should read what Einstein said. In other words, you think that there are misguided Israelis? I wouldn't call them misguided Israelis. I would call them naive Israelis who don't study history and who don't study Einstein. Or Begin. Well, I don't know. Begin withdrew from, from Sinai. I don't know if that was a wise move either. But in the meantime, that was another example with Egypt. But uh, unfortunately, our politicians nowadays don't seem to understand that words mean nothing. Do you think that there was a, a, a prejudice in assembling, assembling the panel without someone defending your point of view? It's not really my point of view. It's basically, I believe, in balanced point of view. I'm not an extremist, and I'm not a dove or a or whatever hawk. I'm 
I feel I like to have balanced point of view. And it a, was a great example of an imbalanced point of view where we were forced into debating a very defeatist attitude. We have to surrender and getting nothing back in return. I find that unacceptable. Now, if they could prove the point that we, this will bring peace, I would be very happy and the first one to sign on to peace.